I grew up as a, a boy going to church, uh, and I always remember World Communion Sunday as uh, a really unique day. And you know, here as a, as a, a teenager uh, in a Presbyterian church, I thought all the Christians in the world were celebrating communion the same way we were. Well, <clears throat> the uh, reality hit me later, of course, when I realized that communion was celebrated in quite different ways with different understandings. And the um, subject tonight of our, of our presentation is about communion and whether some of those differences of traditions are being um, uh, somehow moved through. And uh, uh, on, in the future, we, we see hope of um, bringing our churches more closely together. I am very excited about the event tonight, and I just wanted to tell you quickly how it will proceed um, in, the, in the rest of the evening's format. We will have uh, an introduction and then present an award, and then we will hear Father Crossan's address. And during this whole time, um, please be thinking of questions you would like to submit. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, there will be sort of in the center at the bottom a chat feature. And uh, that chat feature will um, allow you to submit a question and we will uh, go through the questions and pair up ones that are similar. And then um, we will um, be um, prioritizing those uh, as, we, as we move through them. Uh, then after the address, uh, Dr. Katherine Johnson will give a response, um, she will be, be introduced, and you can continue to ask questions at that point. And after the response, we will have the opportunity for uh, Father Crossan to return and respond to your questions. So we begin now uh, the rest of the uh, evening event, the uh, Fiegel, 13th Fiegel event and lecture for ecumenism. And I would like now to turn it over to uh, Dr. Ahmed Alwani, who will present our uh, speaker and recipient of our award. Dr. Alwani, longtime colleague uh, and the president of Fairfax University of America and vice president of the International Institute of Islamic Thought. Um, I know that this event is, is um, mainly focused on Christian unity. And so the last thing that I want to do is actually to take away from this focus. However, when Larry approached me to introduce Father Crossan, our 2021 Ecumenism Award recipient, I welcomed it and I was thrilled by it. Um, the reason for that is I've known Father Crossan not only as a friend and as a colleague for over 20 years. The first time we met, I think it was 2020, 20, 2000, 2000 and. 2001, I believe, uh, before 9-11. It was uh, probably March about this time of, of, of the year when we first met. Um, and I, I went to his office in Washington, D.C. to meet him, uh, to talk to him about his, our school, the School of Islamic and Social uh, Sciences, to join the consortium. Uh, to me, he was, since the beginning and since I've known him, he is the embodiment of ecumenism and interfaith and interfaith and, and uh, interreligious dialogue. Father Crossan has had an illustrious career shaped by a deep spiritual calling that has bridged the worlds of academia, religious life, pastoral work, Christian unity, and interreligious dialogue. He walks the walk of a truly spiritual ecumenist. But he once thought in the beginning of his life that he might be a mathematician. So he earned a bachelor's degree, summa cum laude in mathematics uh, from the Sales University of Pennsylvania. Then he was drawn to the Catholic University of America where he earned a master's in theology, master's in psychology and a PhD in moral theology. As a scholar, Father Crossan has made significant contributions to the field of moral theology with books entitled Everyday Virtues, Walking in Virtue, Moral Decisions and Spiritual Growth in Daily Life, and What Are They Saying About Virtue, plus numerous articles. One early book sums up much of his own way of encountering others, and that is Friendship, the Key to Spiritual Growth. 
Indeed, one thing people remember about John Crossan is that he approaches others with an open heart, open hand, and as a friend, no doubt being an oblate of St. Francis de Sales, a religious life marked by the virtues of humility, charity, joy, and hope in everyday life have helped Father Crossan present himself as a friend to everyone that he meets. His love for spiritual ecumenism based on deep friendship across boundaries is an extension of this Salesian spirituality. Out of love for his order, he served as their provincial counselor for over six years, among other positions, and also taught and served as academic dean for two years and president for 10 years of the DeSales School of Theology in DC. As a priest for over 40 years, Father Crossan has served as a spiritual director for seminarians, priests, and the laity, but been involved in renewal movements like Hersia and was involved in the marriage preparation ministry of engaged encounter for over 25 years. Father Crossing contribution to ecumenism and Christian unity have been long and deep. He's a longtime member and past president of the North American Academy of Ecumenists, organized two of their national conferences. He served as executive director of the Secretariat for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops from 2011 to 2016, where he staffed numerous bilateral and interfaith dialogues, most notably the epic agreement between the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops called Declaration on the way. Additional dialogues were held with Episcopalian, Methodist, Reformed, Orthodox, and Oriental Orthodox, and the Polish National Catholic Church. From 1998 to 2011, Father Crossan served as the executive director of the Washington Theological Consortium, where he pioneered ecumenical uh, studies and projects in religious and science, Certificate of Study in Ecumenism, and a Doctor of Ministry in Ecumenism at Wesley. He broadened the membership of the consortium by welcoming a new member in the Baptist, Presbyterian, and Historic Black Theological Schools of Richmond Theological Consortium Schools. The Evangelical Capital Bible Seminary joined the consortium during his tenure. The Shalem Institute for Spiritual Formation and the Woodstock Theological Center and Library where he had served as a fellow. He also secured the support for these annual lectures from Mr. Jack Fiegel, a lifelong ecumenist and publisher between Eastern and Western Christians. During these years, he taught in numerous schools of the consortium, including Wesley Theological Seminary, Catholic University of America, Virginia Theological Seminary, and the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Gettysburg. He also continued writing with over a dozen articles on ecumenism in the Journal for Ecumenical Studies, Ecumenical Trends, the um, Seminary Ridge Review, and a book honoring Archbishop Sivalad Skopelis by Eastern Christian Publishing. Even while serving as the Director of Spiritual Formation of the St. Luke Institute in recent years, he continued ecumenical work beyond his immediate duties by serving as consulate, uh, consulator to the Pontifical Council for Reporting Christian Unity from 2014 to 2020, and by serving as a member of Pontifical Council's team for the joint working group with the World Council of Churches from 2014 to the present. Father Crossan has extended his reach from ecumenical to interreligious dialogue. Over the years, finding the same Sulpician virtues of listening and humility to serve both arenas. While at the consortium, he invited the visionary in interfaith work, Diane Tashminji, to endow an annual event for interreligious dialogue. He served on the board of directors of the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington and later invited them to join the consortium. And most notably, he worked with the board of trustees to broaden their educational mission 
into interfaith work by inviting the first Muslim graduate school in the U.S. to join the Graduate School of Islamic and Social Sciences, where I was the executive dean at the time. Um, and I do remember that the bylaws of the consortium at the time had to be changed uh, because it did not allow for Muslim members. So uh, at the time, he um, discussed with the board to change the bylaws actually to and introduce the affiliate membership. Um, and we were, I believe, the first member, the School of Islamic and Social Sciences was the first affiliate member of the consortium. So thank you for that. While at the U.S. Um, Conference of Catholic Bishops, Father Crossan's office worked with Catholic University to hold 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council's document, Nostere Atate, on interreligious relations. During these days, the Muslim partners agreed to a once a year national dialogue, meeting for the first time. In addition, Father Crossan's office led three reg regional Muslim dialogues and two Jewish dialogues, among others. Father Crossan's continues his religious life of joy and hope by working on ecumenical and interreligious dialogue and issues that make a difference. Currently, he's working on a book on ecumenical ethics, and I'm sure what he has to say today is inspiring, compelling, and something that you all will look forward to hear. I am pleased that the Washington Theological Consortium honors him as the recipient of the 2021 Ecumenism Award. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alwani. I would like now to turn this uh, to Ambassador Anthony Quinton, who is the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Consortium for the presentation of the award. Thank you, Larry. You have heard about John's wonderful career. And it won't surprise anyone who is watching tonight that we are honoring him for his lifetime of work in the service of the church, in the service of interreligious dialogue, in the promotion of ecumenical understanding. There's a word which we can only use rarely in this connection, but appropriately tonight, we celebrate this man's work, this gifted preacher, this loyal servant of the church. And celebrate is the word which is the keynote, I venture to say, of the address that he will give later. Because when we talk about communion, we often talk about celebrating it, that this is the one part of the worship of the church in which Christians Unite in carrying out Christ's example, although not necessarily uniting in how they understand that example and its meaning. We celebrate John, we celebrate the gift of the Eucharist, and we are proud and pleased to give him this award tonight. And if it can appear on the screen, I will read to you the citation, which is on the plaque, which unfortunately we can't give John in person, but we will make sure that he gets it in, in short order. Uh, I've been working with John for quite a long time and it's a particular pleasure to give him the award, which you can see here, which is made for his outstanding contributions to ecumenical dialogue, scholarship, education, and leadership in the service of Christian unity. On the 23rd of February, 2021. John, congratulations, thanks, and we look forward to hearing your words of hope and encouragement in this long and difficult but positive work of promoting the unity among all Christians as they serve, as they seek to serve, the founder of, uh, of, our, of our choice, the Christian message, uh, Jesus Christ himself. Thank you, John. Uh, she is the former um, 
director of the Ecumenical and Interreligious Relations Office of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America and Professor Emeritus of Historical Theology at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, Dr. Johnson. It's both a privilege and a pleasure to offer this response to John's address on the direction of ecumenism. And it's also a joy to see him join the list of such a distinguished list of previous recipients of this consortium ecu uh, ecumenical award. There were so many treasured co-workers in the Vineyard of Christian Unity on that list. When John was at the US Conference of Catholic Bishops and I was at the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we worked together both on the 12th round of the US Catholic National Dialogue and on the pioneering project toward full communion, the Declaration on the Way, to which John referred. John spoke often and warmly of his days at the consortium, and I know that he rejoices at the participation of so many students in this event. He began his remarks this evening with the image of cresting a mountain, with the destination known to be ahead, but at the end of an adventurous journey of uncertain length and unknown difficulty. It reminded me of a drive the two of us took together just four years ago. Together we were speaking exactly on the topic of the road to full communion and addressing pastors at the West Virginia Synod of the ELCA. As we were driving out for Washington, from Washington and came to the mountains, we found ourselves unexpectedly in a swirling snowstorm. And all of a sudden, our arrival seemed uncertain. The road could not be discerned. Well, a bishop called and encouraged us to persevere. And all of a sudden, with equal uh, unexpectedness, we were in the blinding sunshine and we came to our destination. Just as much an ecumenical metaphor was the reception that John experienced from the participants in that conference. He had more friends already among that group of Lutherans than I did, because they had studied with him and learned from him in their days at the consortium. It's most fitting that his address tonight is filled with so much hope for what Mark Jordan calls the transforming fire of theological formation and what it can offer on the road to Christian unity. I think a central challenge in John's address is to bring together two important insights of ecumenical practice. First, he calls our attention to the insights of the receptive ecumenism movement that emphasize the valuing of the gifts of other communities and then seeking mutually to learn from one another so that all are strengthened, changed, and healed. And then John adds to that, a citation of the method developed especially in Lutheran Catholic dialogue, known as the differentiated consensus. This method helps us articulate both the importance of enduring differences among traditions, and it helps us think about the ways in which those differences enrich us, and possibly about the limits and the boundaries <clears throat> of proper witness that can be recognized. I want to ask what happens when we look at these two ecumenical resources put together so closely. The most obvious thing we see is that it's good to have lots of different resources, many tools for the work of Christian unity, but I want to focus on something more specific. It's not only the gifts of the each other's community which enrich us in receptive ecumenism, it is also the gifts of each highly distinct relationship. Receptive ecumenism has commended itself in a wide variety of diverse ecumenical settings, and it is suggestive also for the deeply related but distinct work of interreligious exploration. Identifying the areas of differentiated consensus is a gift from the particular encounter of Lutherans and Catholics. While it can be brought to bear in other conversations, it cannot be divorced from its roots in that specifically close, historically fraught, theologically intense, and now hopeful encounter. So its contributions are inseparable 
from the breakthrough of the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, which John discussed. This is still uniquely a place where two ecclesial traditions officially and publicly changed their teaching about one another and recognized in the other common faithful confession of a central affirmation of Christian faith. And in this way, if only quietly at first, Lutherans and Catholics started to think about one another differently, pray for each other differently, and to prepare themselves to move forward. The possible implications of that common affirmation are still being worked out. It is under that umbrella that Catholics and Lutherans ask one another about being fully in communion with each other. They don't do this for themselves alone, but they are aware of the uh, accountability that they have to all the other instances of broken communion in the Christian family. Yet they are working in this particular context. Of course, the roads forward can be many, and the gifts from the particularity of Orthodox Catholic or Methodist Episcopalian or Reformed Pentecostal and other ongoing relationships will find new ways to reframe questions, honor different experiences, work together for our common communities, and pray and work together for Christian unity. We need all these conversations, all these histories, all these ways of trying to move forward. Relationships, as well as traditions, have gifts to offer. So let me speak for just a moment about the particular gifts from the Lutheran-Catholic relationship. Out of the work of differentiated consensus and the joint declaration, 2017, the 500th uh, anniversary of the Lutheran movement, was celebrated in a completely different way than it could have been without that breakthrough to have Pope Francis and the Lutheran World Federation together inaugurate the Reformation year was a remarkable change in the way that we spoke about each other. John and I spent a good deal of that uh, time going around talking about the possibilities of full communion in local communities in the United States. People were surprised at the theological achievements that had been reached, and they expressed without exception in every community where either of us was, great yearning to be able to move forward toward full communion because they experienced the hurt in their families, in their relationships at work, in their common work for justice of the separations among Christian uh, communities. I remember particularly uh, in St. John's, uh, in Collegeville, Minnesota, where there's a Benedictine community, a Lutheran woman saying to me, I have been Christian friends with a sister in this community for 30 years, and we have shared all aspects of our Christian faith except the Eucharist. Will we be able, before we die, to share that sacrament together with the blessings of our church? Is anyone working on this? Answer me yes or no. John would invite you to join those who are working on this because there is yearning out there for this movement toward full communion. I learned to ask the question when someone said uh, something like that to me, to ask the question, does your pastor, does your bishop know how much you care about this? I would encourage you especially you students, to learn to open those conversations with people about the yearning that they have. If we do those things, we can make our relationship a form of strength against the polarizing and the division, the increasing retreat to um, the tribalisms that we identify in our society. Now, all of what John has invited us to is so consonant with his particular Christian life. He showed us that in the way he concluded his address. My hope would be that each of us would root our prayers, our work, our trust in God for Christian unity as deeply in our own Christian life as we have seen that John does, and to find ways to build relationships with other persons and with other communities that will help us to move forward.
Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. It's, yes, thank you. it's inspiring to see um, travelers on the road towards unity um, and uh, the work that y'all have done together. Um, now we need to uh, turn to questions um, and uh, Father Crossan, I'm gonna bring you back on. Uh, we yeah. understand that some of you may need to leave at our ascribed hour of 8.45. Uh, I, I will invite others who can to stay on for a few more moments uh, so that we can get to many of these excellent questions. Um, I'm gonna ask some very basic questions at first, uh, uh, Father Crossan. And, and this is just to help some of us who um, don't know a lot about ecumenism to get some clarification. Um, one question uh, is about, let's see, I've, I've ordered these in different way than they come up. Um, a question is just a, a question of organizations. What place does ecumenism or Christian unity play in the National Council of Churches and World Council of Churches? Uh, can you give us a, a 45 second answer? <laughs> uh, well, they've been at it for a long time. They've been at it for a long time at the World Council and the National Council of Churches. They, they're composed of large groups of churches in this country, and uh, there's 300 and some in the World Council, and they do uh, work together uh, regularly and it, through organizations they have and, and have made uh, substantial progress on money issues like what is the church and Excellent. so on and so forth. Some recent documents that are getting a lot of discussion in ecumenical circles is what immediately comes to mind. So, so yes, and then, of course, Cap the Catholic Church is participating in the World Council, in the Faith and Order work and other work. And, and so too, I attended a, uh, uh, the, the yearly meet, the meetings of the National Council of Churches for the Bishops' Conference, you know, as they occurred and uh, uh, participated in small group discussions. And actually right. in my previous life at the consortium, I worked, I was the Catholic uh, for a statement of the National Council of Churches on God's love for the poor. There were six of us, uh, a couple of whom were watching actually, uh, at least Catherine Gree was on the list, yeah. and we met for well, almost three years every month uh, to work here in the in Washington to work on the state. Excellent. So, yeah, I'm going to keep you moving. There is a lot going on. Okay, Go I'm going to keep you moving, and, and these are these are just basic, uh, little short answers. Are there any major denominations not interested in ecumenism? Uh, uh, there are some groups at Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, for example, uh, and those. Uh, for, uh, they are, uh, they're the one that occurred to me that uh, they're interested in some of their uh, things, but, and I had some dealings with them, uh, but they're not that interested in the human. So there are some uh, okay. players, but most of the major players are. Very good. You mentioned Eucharistic sharing. Um, can you uh, define that and um, identify what denominations would it apply to? Everybody in ecumenism or, or just the more sacramental churches or what? Uh, it tends to be uh, more of a discussion in the sacramental churches, of course, and it's uh, Orthodox and Catholics will say, when we reach full communion, then we'll be able to have communion together. Uh, most of the mainline Protestant churches have intercommunion uh, uh, regularly. All of them have been influenced by the liturgical movement that started in the 1880s uh, at, at, with the revival of uh, Sunday Eucharist and uh, et cetera. So it, it is a, a central piece of uh, what full communion will be. Um, it would uh, be a central that, piece of what full communion would be, yes. On that note, we had two questions about a possible um, challenge here around sacramental theology and that's uh, the notion of the mass or the eucharist as sacrifice and uh, as a, a possible um point of division between especially lutherans and catholics any any remarks there uh the uh recent 2017 statement uh of the lutheran catholic dialogue of finland actually dealt directly with that issue and believe they've solved it okay and wow. uh, in a small discussion group i'm part of we had a a whole meeting about that because of the Lutheran Catholic group. 
One thing I should note, I don't think it's completely wise just to look at documents and engage in some uh, non-contextual analysis. One needs to learn a little bit about the movement, but also one needs to meet some people. If you're talking mm -hmm. about Lutheran Catholic differences, and you're a Catholic, you should be talking to some Lutherans. It can't just be some arcane academic study of a part of a text. It loses the context, both academic, but also interpersonal, which Catherine very well referred to in her remarks. Yes, mm -hmm. that's, that's, very, that's one of your great gifts, by the way. Um, the uh, one more basic kind of question, and that is, um, uh, and this is a perception uh, here of the Catholic Church that the Catholic Church has some dogmas which they believe are infallible, um, uh, such as uh, teachings about Mary and, and the Eucharist and the like. And does that mean uh, if, if there's going to be unity with other churches or ecclesial bodies, does that mean that those other churches must agree with all of these dogmas? Uh, it depends. First of all, you have to, uh, there's great writing in Catholic circles by leading ecclesiologists. I'm not an ecclesiologist, I'm a moralist by training and a developmental psychologist also by training as Ahmed mentioned in his introduction. Uh, it, it's, there is extensive work on that and on the understanding of and limits to uh, involve the teaching or, or doctrinal teaching and what circumscribes that which are not necessarily that well known outside of professional circles. And in an ecumenical dialogue situation, you have to be aware of what exactly is being said about doctrine. Mm -hmm. And it's not <laughs> like some, uh, you know, uh, limited understanding. You have to really go into depths of what uh, the teaching was and what it meant and how it is being interpreted these dates uh, uh, by the Second Vatican Council, for example. Yeah. And hence that crucial notion of differentiated uh, consensus uh, between that, that uh, maybe a, a dogma or a teaching of the church could have uh, differentiated understandings in different uh, traditions or communities. Yeah, or even different. within the history of the Catholic Church itself. If you look at the Middle Ages and look at the Franciscan strain, strand, now it was kind of brought up in the domestic strand, but, but there, there's a revival going on of, of Bonaventure and Scotus and those types of thinkers, as well as some of the Benedictines, uh, that there was a variety of interpretations uh, along the way. Not everything was set in place uh, like I was taught when I was a boy, you know. Yes. Um, differences, uh with uh, East and West uh, around the papacy, and also, I guess, between uh, the Roman Church and, and the Roman Catholic Church and, and um, many Protestants, uh, it appears to be a roadblock for some. Uh, but what has, what have been the developments about uh, the understanding of uh, the papacy and the Bishop of Rome, and what do you see on the horizon? Um, is there hope here? Oh, there's huge hope. Now, I should defer to Monsignor McPartland at Catholic U, who's a leading international expert on all these issues, a high-profile member of the International Catholic Orthodox Dialogue, and you'd be surprised how much agreement there is. And if you read some of his new book, you would see where the re what little remains to be resolved could be resolved. It, 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 in some ways, it, did, it gets into other types of issues but not that particular question, which is just astounding uh, if you looked at these things 30 years ago. But I would just uh, follow Monsignor McPartland because he knows and it's not that distant. And it is, I think in some ways unacceptable among Protestant communities, uh, what is being talked about. See, so this is a very, it's very interesting. Uh, it's kind of beyond my field, but it's, I have, read his writings with, him, with great interest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I do want to recognize people who do need to leave um, uh, at this hour. Uh, uh, please um, um, just say farewell to everyone in the, in the chat box. But for those who can stay with us uh, a little bit longer, I, there are some other really fantastic questions that I'd like to um, share. Um, one um, is uh, a challenging one, and that is, um, the, uh, the issues of, of gender and sexuality uh, that have 
uh, come to the churches uh, around women's ordination, same-sex marriage, um, uh, they seem to be insurmountable issues, according to uh, this individual, um, insurmountable in the pursuit of visible unity, including the uh, understanding of, uh, or actually having full uh, sacramental um, communion, understanding the, the holy orders, uh, and um, understanding of the, the ordination of, of pastors, etc. Um, am I wrong to see these as insurmountable? Uh, uh, is it possible to move towards sacramental communion uh, without coming to a determinate resolution of these kinds of gender and sexuality issues first? Uh, well, uh, I have a, a stated position on this, actually. If people uh, are, 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 you know, it's not, not secret. Uh, these issues were not addressed much in the dialogue. Really, when I was president of North American Academy of Humanists, we had our 2010 meeting in Washington at, at the fall meeting uh, for three days on moral theology. Because people were saying, oh, this will never be resolved and all this uh, stuff. Well, you would have said that in the 1970s and 80s about a justification. Mm -hmm. Never be resolved. It's a key issue of reformation and so on, but it was. And I, my position has been Unless we spend the necessary time, we do not know where the spirit will guide us on these. Yes, controverted issues, difficult issues, irresolvable. I'm not conceding that. Because if the spirit guides us and we work hard, uh, then I, I think there are ways will emerge to address these contentious issues. And some of which are interested, are, are listed in the 15 issues and declaration on the way, you know. So, you have, so don't give up yes. too soon. <laughs> okay, good, good. A question about um, where you see our current political um, environment in the U.S., especially um, some of the challenges I'm assuming around um, uh, divisions uh, in the society, issues about uh, justice and, and uh, racial uh, equity. Um, what... Uh, what do you foresee will be impacts of these kinds of issues on the ecumenical movement here in the U.S.? Uh, it's very difficult to say. Uh, I'm no expert in politics either, but it, it, the fact is that uh, it, we're talking social justice issues. Uh, certainly Catholic Church teaching is pretty clear, as is the teaching uh, of uh, the, in, in the Protestant, a lot of the Protestant churches as well, uh, including some evangelicals, you know, uh, evangelical seminaries and, and the like. And so uh, uh, there might be uh, some divisive points here. Uh, the question, uh, well, let me say this. They, uh, uh, Dr. Awani mentioned already this book, and I'm in the middle of writing it, and uh, uh, this comes up. So I haven't quite worked my way through everything, uh, but I'm going to do that. I think, uh, yes, the churches, maybe not every single person, as I said, 80% might come into the communion. Uh, but I do think that on these types of things, there, it, there, there can be a common path forward. Does the communion have I'm pretty sure of it. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, thinking. That, I think that's a lot e easier than the previous previous question. Uh -huh. I mean, in terms of uh, intellectual uh, resolution, yeah. and the resolution in society, but well, that's another whole ballgame, and I'm not competent to talk about that. Um, there's a, uh, two more questions I do want to address, and uh, uh, about kind of the, the direction we're moving in, um, um, in, in ecumenism, and what you see on the horizon. Uh, and wonderful and beautiful image about the uh, the movement um, where we're where we're moving. Um, the um, one question is really about the. Um, it's a typical uh, kind of concern, I think, in a, a, an environment like America, where individual rights and, and the uh, right to. Um, um, believe differently from one another is, is a, a, a real value, um, whether it's a religious liberty or just a, a, a non-believers believing differently. Yeah. Um, 
how do we avoid the risk of ecumenical consensus devolving into kind of exclusive rules that um, um, ignore the, the views or the needs of um, non-believers and maybe some believers? Well, uh, moral theology is about practicing the virtues, hmm. which is more open-ended. Respect hmm. for everyone, gentleness, compassion, and of course, love them, you know, which is my area. And and then within that, uh, the legal part has, you know, the deontology, as we call it technically, uh, has a place, but it's not the primary place. I, now, some would argue against that. Some more tension kind of people would argue against mm -hmm. that. But I'm um, certainly, and the dominant school, and I, in an article years ago, I wrote about how the virtue ethics thinkers and all the major Christian traditions in this country. So it's a widespread movement about who the person is becoming. Mm -hmm. And then how do you become that kind of pers person that Christ would have us be under and sends us the spirit to enable us to do it. So, it, it sounds like in this sense that the uh, the spiritual approach to ecumenism, very relational approach and virtue approach, right. might even have something to teach the wider society in our in our divisions. Well, I do think the pandemic points out to the uh, uh, problems with uh, radical uh, individualism or libertarian kinds of points of thing, say in the economy. And the fact that we are relational beings, and I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that the pendulum might swing more back to the center. That we we are relational beings all the time, from when we're conceived, and 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 in eternity. Uh, so the question is then, what's the balance between the individual? And I think uh, in recent decades last 40 or 50 years, certainly in the economy, but more than that, it shifted to freedom. The freedom used to be, in Lincoln's time, more about politics. Everybody voted in those days. They were here, yes, and there was a certain freedom living on the frontier, but it was seen as political freedom, not I should be able to do whatever what I want almost in any instance. That uh, is more individualistic expressionism the habits of the heartful uh, three decades mm -hmm. ago talked a lot about this. Uh, but I do think we could be we could be at least questioning radical individualism and say, well, the individual is important, but also the relationships are important. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So thank you. T t uh, two, uh, I, I, I thought there were only two, but there are actually two left about uh, where we're headed. And you've mentioned a great deal about the Holy Spirit and its involvement uh, yeah. and given real concrete examples. There's a question here, though, about the Trinity. Uh, the question is this. One fear around unity building is fueled by the kind of zero-sum game that, you know, somebody's going to gain, somebody's going to lose. Right. Um, and yet the Trinity shows a different mystery of unity um, uh, mm -hmm. within diversity. And how might drawing on Trinitarian prayer, song, devotion help overcome this barrier of fear in dialogue and in our relations with um, one another? Well, the Trinitarian emphasis is something I, I, I get into when I have more time. <laughs> and situating that. And actually, one author who I agree with argues that the two approaches I uh, talked about uh, uh, the joint, uh, the joint declaration differentiated consensus and then the sharing of the gifts uh, they're both trinitarian at root ah. and argues okay so these p2 approaches fit together they're trinitarian and one enables the other okay so uh, so there there is this uh, thing and what was the second part of your question you had a, 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 uh, that um, but it, 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 you sort of answered it in that it, yeah. how can drawing on Trinitarian um, devotion, prayer, etc. help uh, overcome the fear of, of some one side winning, one side losing? Yeah, in other exactly. words, more, more relational. Um, more relational. You know, everybody uh, needs, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, it's uh, 
we're all enriched by being together in relationship uh, rooted in the Trinity. So excellent. This so is the final. The communal expert, uh, a communal part of Christianity. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you for the. So, thanks to all for the questions. They were great questions. Uh, there's one more. There's one more, okay, and it's about where what we what we really need to look for on the finish line, and that is um, with the great strides. Um, is the is the goal that we want to see at the uh, finish line um, um, a joint communion? I, I think that's a Eucharistic uh, and sacramental um, uh, phrase. Uh, and mutual recognition of, of one another's ministries or holy orders, or should we be striving for something more, something different than holy orders and sacramental unity? Well, uh, those are two parts of it, but it would be have to be more. It, 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 when we talk about full communion, you know, we, that's why I'm delving in more into the uh, social justice, the moral teaching, and, and so forth, because, uh, I mean, that, it, it's what's in the gospel. Mm. Mm. So if you're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, well, then there's certain uh, moral pieces to that, you know, and yeah. therefore, uh, you're going to have to, it, can't, it won't be exclusively sacram sacramental or organizational or whatever, ecclesiological. It, it would have multiple dimensions, uh, full communion. Thank you. It, it, it's well, take a while. <laughs> well, I, you've, you've allowed me to grill you really quickly uh, to, tonight, Father Crossan, and you've been uh, wonderful, and the address was uh, deeply inspiring. Thanks to a wonderful um, participants for really uh, insightful and uh, um, meaningful questions. I do, um, at this time, um, invite everyone to uh, give a, a symbolic round of applause <laughs> for uh, Father Crossan. And, thank uh, you. His, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for again uh, for the honor of doing this. Well, really and it's it. our, our privilege to, uh, to be with you this evening and, and share this award with you. Um, you've meant so much to this organization and, and to all of our theological schools and our, um, our churches. I, we have two quick things, uh, two quick announcements. Uh, I want to turn over to uh, Ridgeway Addison, who's a member of our board, for a very quick um, announcement at this time. Thanks, Larry. And I uh, just wanted to start uh, briefly here by saying thank you, Jack, Jack Beagle. Many thanks for not only this year, but also uh, your sponsorship and leadership for this over so many previous years. The 13th um, Beagle Lecture. Thank you. Thank you also, Father Crossan, for your work tonight. Uh, as Larry mentioned, I'm a public trustee. Uh, I'm also a very proud uh, graduate uh, with a PhD from Catholic University in 2011, Father Crossan in spirituality. So thanks for mentioning that tonight. Uh, we've enjoyed, I think, both in worship and in thought and in scholarship unity tonight. Um, and hopefully, as, as I turn to look at other screens, um, I'm gonna hope that this unity will guide me to uh, work even more in finding a deeper common way forward through all of the racial, religious, and political conflict that's all around us than it has been specifically for the last few years. Uh, as we're thinking about new strategic planning at the consortium, we're also thinking about entering a new phase of our own ecumenical work and witness. Um, Father Cross and I don't know if uh, we could borrow those notes from you tonight because they sound right up our alley. We want to um, particularly strengthen our, our programming for current students and alumni. And more particularly, we want to be able to partner and contract with an ecumenical specialist, a specialist who would teach in and across our member schools and related public programs. Um, they might teach, they would coach, maybe even design some curricula. And again, those growing edges that you named tonight, Father Cross, and those are the ones that we would like to be able to partner with them on. Um, I'm development chair. I believe powerfully in the spirit of God, and so I ask you in that confidence mm -hmm. that we would welcome a gift from you tonight to help fund this special position. You can make a contribution easily on our website, and you can do so tonight, but if you are potentially interested in a more formal underwriting of this contracted position, Larry Goldman, um, our executive director and I would love to, to talk with you. And here's my contact information in, um, in the chat. Thank you, Ridgeway. Thank you very much. Uh, a final note from um, the 
person who makes all of this possible in this yearly event, Jack Fiegel. Jack. Thank you, Larry. Uh, good evening, everyone, and congratulations, Father John, uh, for being the uh, award winner uh, for this year. Uh, in a long line of distinguished ecumenists, you now join the club. Congratulations, <laughs> and, and thank you for your talk. It, it, was, it was very inspiring. Um, I am uh, chairman this year of a special committee of the consortium for the 50th anniversary that we're celebrating uh, this calendar year of the existence of the Th Washington Theological Consortium. And one of our first special events after tonight being sort of the kickoff, uh, we're planning in mid-May, uh, it will be a, a, a multi-panel uh, discussion, virtually of course, uh, these days, uh, on the topic of educating theological leadership for the public square. Um, we have so far um, agreements from two distinguished church leaders to participate in that panel discussion. Uh, first, the local Episcopalian or Episcopal Bishop, uh, Right Reverend Marion Buddy uh, of the Diocese of Washington uh, has uh, expressed uh, a positive interest in participating. And likewise, given that we have virtual uh, connections these days, Archbishop Job of Telmesos, who is the Orthodox co-chair of the International Catholic Orthodox Dialogue. Uh, he lives in Geneva, Switzerland, and he's agreed to participate uh, in that panel discussion. We're also uh, inviting one or two other church leaders. Uh, so my announcement today simply is to watch this space and keep an eye out for something coming in mid-May. And then on June the 22nd, if I could, Larry, just put a quick plug in, the 25th Oriental Illumin Conference uh, of dialogue between Catholics and Orthodox that's grassroots oriented will be held uh, virtually. The theme this year will be liturgy and scripture. And we have a lineup uh, of uh, uh, theologians and ecumenists and also for the first time participation uh, with one of our consortium members, uh, one of our newest ones, the Museum of the Bible. will have two of its curators give presentations as part of the agenda. So again, watch that space the Oriental Lumen Foundation and Conference on June 22nd. Thank you, Larry. Over to you. Thank you, Jack. Um, again, thank you for um, all those who made this possible. Um, one other example of uh, interfaith dialogue that the consortium has done uh, has been the Al Alwani lectures uh, over the years, and we're pleased to announce that um, the uh, lectures uh, for eight of those years have been gathered into a book that has been published by the International um, Institute for Islamic Thought uh, called Fine Differences, edited by Dr. Richard Jones, uh, uh, emeritus of uh, Virginia Theological Seminary and former Awani um, chairholder of Muslim Christian Dialogue. So if you're interested in getting a copy of Fine Differences, please contact me. Um, and um, you, you can also find uh, copies online. So we will try to share with all of you um, how to um, get a free copy online. Thank you um, to Yvonne McKinney, who uh, managed our Zoom and the preparations on Zoom this evening. Thank you to Christy Hammett for putting together the program and working so closely with the student board in their, uh, their excellent service. And again, thanks to the student board and thanks to um, Dr. Katherine Johnson for um, being with us to celebrate this um, marvelous event uh, of Father Crossan's journey and uh, the journey to come for all of us. Blessings and uh, have a wonderful evening. Amen.